Hi everybody, hope you're well. Today I will read from a book titled Miss van der Rohe, An Architect in His Time by Dietrich Neumann, published by Yale University Press. One early morning in the summer of 1962, a truck with East German security agents appeared unannounced in front of August Ludwig's carpentry shop in Mulhausen, a picturesque town behind the Iron Curtain in communist East Germany. The commander asked to see crates that the family had stored in a back room. When Mr. Ludwig obliged, the crates were immediately confiscated, loaded onto the truck and transported away in a military-style operation that left the family shaken. After traveling 300 kilometers north, the truck unloaded its cargo at the Akademie der Kunste in East Berlin. The crates contained the entirety of Miss van der Rohe's and Lily Reich's work from before 1937. The raid in Mulhausen was a key moment, the crucible in the unique process of establishing and defining Miss legacy for posterity. The archive's odyssey has all the trappings of a Cold War drama, deeply entwined as it was with the political tides of its time. When Miss immigrated to the United States in August 1938, he had left his Berlin office and apartment in the hands of Reich, initially thinking he would be gone for only two years. Contrary to his expectations, his contract in Chicago was renewed in 1940. In any event, by then, World War II had broken out and a return or even a visit to Germany was out of the question. At the same time, Albert Speer's megalomaniac redesign of Hitler's Berlin as Germania had commenced with demolitions for an intended broad north-south axis. Miss home since 1915, am Karlsbad 24, in the elegant Tiergarten district, was one of the first casualties. Once the permit was issued on June 3, 1939, the inhabitants were notified and given a time frame to relocate. Shortly after receiving this news, Lili Reich left to visit Miss in Chicago from July through September 1939, and after her return, she started to pack up the office. This was the moment when Miss drawing some paperwork and many of Reich's were put into crates for storage. The building was taken down in November 1940. Toward the end of the war, when bombardments were imminent, Reich entrusted the crates to their collaborator and former student, Edward Ludwig, who brought them to his parents' home in Mulhausen, which was unlikely to be bombed. After the war, Communist East Germany was cumbersome to reach from the West, requiring costly visas and much advanced planning. Ludwig kept misinformed writing a few weeks after Lili Reich's death on December the 14th, 1947. According to a list among Mrs. Reich's papers, there are many plans and original drawings of your early work in the boxes that are with my parents in Thuringia. He promised to look through them on his next visit to see what can be used to get better image reproductions. Three years later, Ludwig again updated Mies about his estate. The boxes with your work are still in Mulhausen, Thuringia, in the eastern sector. They are safe there, and I can't risk transporting them through the Soviet zone. It would be a pity if they got lost. Even sending the material in small individual packages to Berlin is impossible, since every package is being opened and censored. By 1958, West German art historian Hans Maria Wingler had heard about these boxes. While writing a history of the Bauhaus, he contacted Ludwig and then went to Mulhausen several times in 1959 to look through them. Not wanting to alert the authorities, he did so clandestinely. Officially, his mission was to study medieval architecture nearby. Ludwig explained, if the location of these works is known, they will be immediately confiscated by the government of the Eastern Sector. 
the political climate between East and West Germany became more volatile. The Berlin Wall went up in August 1961 and the inner German border was fortified with minefields, dog runs and motion-activated machine guns. Little could be hidden from East German intelligence and Bingler's repeated visits might have caught the attention of the Stasi and triggered the above-mentioned raid. Apparently, no one in East Berlin quite knew what to do with these boxes once they had arrived at the Akademie der Kunste. But then, luck intervened. Kurt Liebknecht, one of the most prominent architects in East Germany, director of the Institute for the Theory and History of Architecture of the Bau Academy and a high-ranking politician, heard of the boxes at the Academy and went to see them. Liebknecht was the nephew of the murdered communist activist Karl Liebknecht and had worked for Mies in 1927, just after the latter had designed the monument to the November Revolution. He remembered his time in Mies' office fondly and wrote to him in September 1962 to assure him that he supported efforts to get his material to him, but asked for permission to make some photocopies first and also asked Mies for samples of his more recent work to make it better known in the countries of the socialist camp. His elevated position in the party hierarchy gave him considerable clout. Any material pertaining to the Bauhaus and Mies' role as a director was taken out and transferred to the Bau Academy. The East German government had begun to embrace the Bauhaus and saw itself as the legitimate custodian of its legacy. The rest of the boxes were released in the fall of 1963. We can imagine a film noir style transfer of the crates from one truck to another in the middle of the night at a heavily guarded checkpoint Charlie. The man who had brought them to Mulhausen, Edward Ludwig, had died in a car crash in 1961, so they ended up in the care of Ludwig Glaser, whom Edward Ludwig had considered stepson and heir as he had been close friends with his mother, Kathy Glaser. Ludwig Glaser had studied architecture at the Technische Universität Berlin. After he graduated, apparently Edward Ludwig had instructed him not to pursue a career as an architect, as he could never be another miss. Instead, Glaser prepared for a career as a historian and curator and studied art history and anthropology at the Freie Universität in West Berlin, where he received his PhD. Meanwhile, Mies made up his mind that his drawings should go to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, his office and personal papers to the Library of Congress, and his library to the University of Illinois in Chicago. According to family lore, this decision, which meant that the material in the boxes was now official American property, had been related to the Secretary of State in Washington, D.C., and as a result, the U.S. ambassador in Moscow spoke to the government officials there. This apparently helped move things along in East Berlin. Glazer turned out to be a screwed negotiator. Once the boxes were in his hands, conversations with Mies' office and the Museum of Modern Art ensued. The result was an unusual qui pro quo. In exchange for releasing the material, Ludwig Glaser was hired by the museum as an assistant to chief curator Arthur Drexler. He arrived in New York in 1963, months before the boxes landed in Chicago. Glazer first gathered experience with a number of small exhibitions before becoming associate curator of architecture in 1964, curator in 1968, and curator of the Miss van der Rohe archive in 1972. He turned out to be excellent at his job, organizing a number of exhibitions and publications about Miss' work, which were measured and thoughtful in their analysis. He initiated an oral history project, interviewing many of Mies' surviving colleagues, clients and collaborators. The boxes themselves had first gone to Chicago, where they arrived in December 1963, and Mies apparently was in no hurry to look at them. The one box labeled Lili Reich he never opened at all. 
They were stored in the basement of Mee's office at 230 East Ohio Street in Chicago. Finally, Ed Duckett, supervisor of the model workshop, took charge and made them available to curious visitors, such as Arthur Drexler from the Museum of Modern Art. In 1965, Mies made an initial gift of 86 drawings to MoMA, which celebrated the event with the show Mies van der Rohe Architectural Drawings from the Collection in February and March 1966. Most of the drawings were minor renderings of unexecuted courtyard houses, but the real showstopper was the large charcoal perspective of the Friedrichstrasse skyscraper of 1922. Two years later, the Art Institute of Chicago followed suit with a large exhibition in which the Friedrichstrasse skyscraper was joined by a drawing of the concrete office building in the lobby of the museum. The same year, MoMA placed the Neue Nationalgalerie in Berlin at the center of a show about new museum buildings. The pieces that Mies gave to the Museum of Modern Art outright were labeled Gift of the Architect, while the rest became part of his bequest and would arrive after his death in 1969, when the Mies van der Rohe archive was established. Philip Johnson provided initial financial support for the archive to begin cataloging and conservation. Substantial annual contributions from Phyllis Lambert and the Friends of the Miss van der Rohe Archive, a group chaired by Myron Goldsmith, secured its continuation. It is worth pausing for a moment to recognize the important and unusual fact that Mies decided to preserve all traces of his work and practice from around 1922 onward, right after he changed his name, converted the family rooms at home into office space and joined the avant-garde with several eye-catching visionary projects. He also simultaneously began to engage in publicity in his own behalf, initiating articles, submitting images to publications and exhibitions. He seems to have suddenly understood both the importance of his work and the importance of shaping its public perception. There is an obvious correlation between the existence of a vast personal archive and an architect's legacy. Wright, Le Corbusier, Kahn and Ponti all carefully documented their work. In Mies's case, it took many lucky breaks for his material to survive, and there is a certain irony in the fact that a communist functionary in East Germany, Kurt Liebknecht, and an architect and curator in the United States who had sympathized with the Third Reich, Philip Johnson, contributed substantially to his archive's existence. In retrospect, the raid in Mulhausen probably helped to keep the material together and prevented its loss, damage or dispersal on the art market. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.